Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News, on iTunes, one word, Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Yesterday I posted a video on the Jermaine Taylor situation. Taylor in the past had bleeding on the brain after a boxing match, right? Understand too that in some fights preceding <clears throat> the boxing match in which he got knocked out by Arthur Abraham, Taylor had faded badly in fights, notably the Carl Frotch fight where Taylor seemed unable to keep Carl Frotch off of him in the 12th round of that match. Let's also remember the first Kelly Pavlik Jermaine Taylor fight where Jermaine Taylor got knocked out in that fight as well. So understand Jermaine Taylor had a knockout history going into that Arthur Abraham fight and in that fight as in the Carl Frotch fight he faded in the later rounds and then he got knocked out later he was diagnosed with bleeding on the brain so it's my belief as I've hope as I hope I stated succinctly in the earlier video that I'm a skeptic of Taylor at the world-class level right let's be clear here Taylor has only had a handful of fights in his comeback, right, post Arthur Abraham. A handful of fights over several years, right? In particular, I'm a big skeptic of Taylor against heavy-handed opponents, right, because he has had bleeding on the brain, as well as mobile moving opponents. Because it's my belief that brain injury would affect coordination, especially as the fighter tires. Taylor already has a history of fading in the later rounds. Having a history of brain injury can't help that situation. Right now, when Taylor was in front of the Nevada State uh, Athletic Commission, he told them that he believed the reason he faded late in rounds was because he was letting himself gain weight between fights. He was also fighting at heavier weights, right? I believe one of his fights against Kelly Pavlik was at 168, right? Taylor believed that if he kept himself in better physical condition, that he wouldn't fade later in fights. I think he's deluding himself. What's interesting though are the comments to the earlier video. Two in particular just stunned me. One of them is from Torsten Stent. He writes, Edwin Valero suffered a brain hemorrhage in a motorcycle accident in 2001 and then went on to have a pro career where he went 27-0 and 0 with 27 KOs. All this bla brain bleed panic in the streets is way overdone. Let me also point out too that Torsten further wrote the Abraham loss was five years ago. Guess what? He has healed in that time. Let me make a few points. And keep in mind, this is an online video. You have access to the internet, right? I would encourage you to look up Edwin Valero on Google and on Bing and on Yahoo. I would encourage you to look at his life outside of the ring and look at how his life ended. You're going to see a tortured soul. 
with obvious signs, obvious signs of mental instability. Now Valero is one of the hardest punchers I've ever seen. His fight against Tony DeMarco is a classic in my eyes. I rarely mention Edwin Valero on this YouTube channel page because of his problems outside of the ring, right? I would rather boxing have other idols other than this individual. Now, let me just say, his problems are so severe, right? I'm not going to get into them here. I want you to research them. The mental instability is so obvious that I need to ask YouTube Nation, are you sure that Jermaine Taylor, who was out on bail at the time of his fight against Sam Solomon, right, for allegedly shooting a family member, right, a shooting that according to reports could easily have been a murder. It's not a murder because the family member pulled through. Are you sure that Jermaine Taylor right now is not showing signs of mental instability? Let me ask you too. And I know Taylor has had a great image, historically. Former Olympian, right? Former good guy, uh, a guy who, you know, comes across as a uh, well-meaning guy, etc. When you heard about the shooting, and we're talking about a shooting so recent that Larry Hazard, right, um, a boxing commissioner in New Jersey, said that he would not have allowed Taylor to fight in New Jersey. Right? When you heard about the shooting, didn't it seem out of character? Didn't it seem unusual? How many other fighters are you rushing to bet on? Who have been involved in a recent shooting and understand the shooting is of someone he knows right it's not of an unknown intruder right Jermaine Taylor according to reports was in his home or someplace like that when he shot the family member right this isn't the same as Jermaine Taylor out on the street being accosted by some stranger and having to defend himself. Though I'm sure self-defense will be part of, you know, his presentation in court. What I would do if I were you is I would look closely at the facts of that case and I would ask myself simply whether I believe Jermaine Taylor was acting coherently and justifiably during that incident, right? When a fighter has had a brain issue and then seems to be behaving erratically afterwards, when you couple that with the fighter himself admitting that in the past he wasn't as dedicated to his craft he didn't stay in shape as much as he should have, then to me, that fighter is a poor betting risk. It's one thing for Taylor to fight unknown fighters in a comeback on the way up. Now he's the IBF middleweight champion. The point I'm making to you is to keep his title to remain credible, he's going to have to fight world-class fighters. You look out on the landscape right now in the middleweight division and you're seeing fighters with big punches, right? Janady Golovkin, Peter Quillen, right? You're seeing mobile fighters, fighters who can move around the ring, who are hard to locate, right? When a fighter is completely alert and in shape, fighters like 
Sergio Martinez, Miguel Cotto, Hassan and Jacob. Right? When I look at a fighter's past and I see bleeding on the brain, and when I look at the fighter's recent fights, and the fighter doesn't look fluid to me. He looks stiff legged. Right? He's not at his best. When I also look on the calendar, and I realized that it was something like nine years ago, that long ago, when Jermaine Taylor fought Bernard Hopkins. In other words, Taylor is older. Understand Taylor is on the other side of 35. To me, that adds up to a fighter who, I would argue, is too risky to bet on. I congratulate him on winning the title right it is a free country I don't begrudge any fighter who wants to continue his career but in my opinion he's a bad betting risk what I also believe too is that and young guys need to hear me clearly when I say this the people around you, many of them, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them won't be around you in 10 years. Right? Think about Junior Seau. Think about the people who were around him when he was a perennial all-pro linebacker. Right? I'm just here to tell you that at the end of his life, Right? Many of those people were not around him. Understand these relationships that you think, especially these business relationships that you think are going to last forever. Well, guess what? Things change over time. People can make promises to you. And then things happen in their lives that change the dynamic of the financial obligations, the shared responsibility the understanding that you thought you had. I encourage everyone here online to Google Michael Spinks, former heavyweight champion, right, the unbeaten champion, who actually beat Larry Holmes and then lost to Mike Tyson. Google his relationship with Butch Lewis, his promoter. According to Michael Spinks, Butch Lewis said, I will financially take care of you for the rest of your life. Michael Spinks agreed to dangerous fights. Guess what? Even the great Butch Lewis was mortal. He ended up dying. Michael Spinks apparently ended up being involved in legal proceedings with Butch Lewis's estate. Right? Jermaine Taylor needs to look at the people around him and he needs to realize that his health is his concern right the people around him might not be around him if his health takes a turn for the worse i cannot explain enough here online how big a risk it is right to have a brain injury from boxing another guy who had bleeding on the brain, unfortunately, too late, right? You know, was Magnamed Abdusalamov. Understand the way these brain injuries operate. Abdusalamov was lucid, went the distance in his fight. Then after the fight, had bleeding on the brain, now his family is suing, right, the New York State Athletic Commission, according to reports, for millions of dollars. Abdul Salamov's career is over. For a while there, it looked like he might not survive, right, as it is. 
right? He His quality of life won't be the same. Understand, at one point he was a professional athlete. Now he is in need of help to live a normal life, right? The above average athletics are a part of the past, right? Understand with brain injury, it can turn like that. Years ago, I saw a fight involving a fighter who was on top of the world, Gerald McClellan. Right, McClellan was on top of the world. I saw him get knocked out by Nigel Bann. McClellan has never recovered. Right, understand some of his boys, Roy Jones, still visits McClellan. But much of the entourage is gone. Right, so... What I want people to also think about, right? And this is from someone who's pro-boxing, right? I'm pro-boxing, and I'm not begrudging Jermaine Taylor's ability to continue his career. What I am saying is the rest of us need to be aware of the dynamic, right? What I'm saying bluntly is if you're a gambler, this is not the guy to bet on. And I say so right after he's won the IBF title. What I want people to do too is I want people to look hard, right? Not just at the Taylor incident, but I want people to look hard at depression and boxing. I believe it's related. Getting hit in the head for a living can't be good for your health. Understand some brave fighters have openly talked about their battles with depression, right? Google Tyson Fury, an unbeaten heavyweight right now, who in interviews has candidly talked about how at times he has the urge to kill himself. Look at James DeGale. Understand DeGale's only lost once, and that loss was debatable, right? Some of the papers covering that fight thought he won the fight. Understand DeGale is an Olympic gold medalist, right? DeGale's real name is James DeGale MBE, right? He's a member of the British Empire, right? He has a title. This is a guy who is Carl Froch's mandatory challenger, right? You would think DeGale, who's young, right, has the world on a string. James DeGale gave an interview where he talked about how he thought seriously about quitting the sport of boxing. He talked about how he was feeling down. What I want people to do is to look up the life of Alexis Arguello. Simply put, Arguello is one of the best fighters I have ever seen. You know, I can tell you. I was a big Alexis Arguello fan. He, to me, symbolized the very best in boxing. Big time puncher. Great, great underlined, great fighter. Gentleman outside of the ring. I personally wonder whether another great fighter, Aaron Pryor, would have beaten Alexis Arguello in the fight in which Panama Lewis in Pryor's Corner said, not that water bottle, the one I mixed, right? Before Pryor drank from some water bottle and then magically seemed to have extra energy in the very next round. Well, understand Arguello, according to reports, killed himself. Right, family members came forward and started talking about how Arguello was feeling down. Right, this was a guy who, you know, when you say Boxing Hall of Famer, it was obvious during his career. Right, great fighter. Um, 
a guy who was involved in politics after he left the ring. In other words, Arguello had a life after boxing where he was giving back to the community. Right? And you know the rest. You know, he had demons. Well, let me say, as you look at the incident, involving Jermaine Taylor shooting a family member and understand whenever there is domestic violence it hints at a greater dysfunction. It means that in Jermaine Taylor's family there is friction. Right? There are problems. Right? The support group isn't as strong as it could be. Right? I encourage everyone to look at that incident right? and honestly ask yourself, is Jermaine Taylor acting erratically? Then I want you to look at the fight, uh, Taylor against Sam Solomon. Then I want you to look at an older fight of Jermaine Taylor. right? Jermaine Taylor against, let's say, Bernard Hopkins. And just ask yourself, is this the same Jermaine Taylor? Right? For anyone who believes that Taylor's loss to Abraham several years ago means that his brain has fully healed and he's fully ready to continue his career. Do you think there's going to be a moment in Magnum Ed Abdu Salamat's life where he's back to normal? Do you feel that had Junior Seau, before he killed himself, just been more patient that he would have been back to normal? Do you feel that these guys who have CTE, right, after multiple hits to the head, do you think that that's the kind of situation that reverses itself? Right? These are the questions we need to ask. Now that Taylor has a title, who's he going to defend it against? What world-class fighters at 160 pounds do you feel confident in saying you would take Taylor over that fighter? Right? Certainly not Peter Quillen. Certainly not Janady Golovkin. I wouldn't take Quillen against Danny Jacobs. Right? Um, Sergio Martinez with a bad knee still has a big punch. I'd take Sergio Martinez over, um, you know, Jermaine Taylor. And just understand... Just like the people in Magnamed Abdusalamov's corner were stunned, literally stunned, at how fast he deteriorated. Understand, he was examined at the arena, and according to reports, right, he was allowed to take a cab to the hospital. They didn't even give him an ambulance. In other words, the people around him didn't sense the urgency. And then his health turned on a dime. Right? Are we going to have adequate warning with Jermaine Taylor? Right? Do you believe that Edwin Valero's behavior outside of the ring is completely disconnected and unrelated to the brain injury he suffered? I'm not sure if it is. Let me also point out that I'm aware that there are other guys, just to give a full picture here, who have had some head injuries. Marco Antonio Barrera, metal plate in his head, and went on to have Hall of Fame careers and are gentlemen outside of the ring and look like they have it all together. Right? Fair enough. That also exists in boxing. But all I'm saying is, when there's a brain injury, there's greater risk involved. This is a gambling site. Let's just say that Jermaine Taylor is a fighter who I'm more likely than not to bet against during his middleweight reign. That's if, of course, he's allowed to continue fighting given the criminal case that is pending against him. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. 
you don't have to agree with me, obviously. Um, you know, if you have other fighters you want to discuss who have had brain injury, if you feel there are other fighters in history who have exhibited erratic behavior outside of the ring, Carlos Monzon comes to mind, uh, if, right, you believe that the incidence of depression and brain injury and in boxing are no greater than they are in general society, and if you have comments about guys involved in uh, collision sports who have had head trauma, I mentioned Junior Seau earlier, right, there are others, Dave Dewerson, Tony Dorsett, and you want to discuss those, I hope you do so in the comment section to this video. Understand, the mainstream media does a lot of things right. But edgier topics like this really don't get discussed enough, right? Because sponsors don't want to look like they're turning a blind eye to the health risks involved in these dangerous sports. And fighters don't want to talk about their health, right? Uh, Jermaine Taylor, no doubt, wants people focusing on his fighting ability, not on his prior medical condition, right? So you have these benign conspiracies, really they're not that benign, conspiracies of silence where, you know, for generations, football players have had higher instances of dementia, depression, etc., Alzheimer's, and uh, it's only recently that the health risks are being discussed out in public. Right? Well, with the help of the internet, this is the non-mainstream part of life, right? It's an interactive forum. Let's make the most of it. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.